We're going to move on uh, through the book of Acts. Uh, I've been uh, leading you through the entire book of Acts, not uh, chapter by chapter, but uh, just thematically some important events in the book of Acts. And uh, if you remember last time, we looked at chapter 12, where James was beheaded and Peter was miraculously rescued from prison. And we saw how uh, God's plan and purpose is actually for both. Uh, I, I mean, this is pretty daring thing to say, but some people will have to live for Christ and others are called to die for Christ. And we looked at, you know, how religion and religious spirit made us believe that if we pray more, God will answer our prayer. Or if we don't pray enough, that God's going to neglect us. That's not how it works. I want you to remember, if you can just, after all the studies of every chapter, if you can just remember one thing about this book, the book of Acts, there's this lesson that God is teaching us. This lesson is that he is in control. We're not in control. He's in control. And this history, Christian history is still an unfolding story of God's kingdom. And God has never lost control. Even his death was planned. Crucifixion of Christ, death and resurrection was all planned. Even those people who are killed for their faith, it is within the planned will of God. So I want you to remember this. That's the backdrop of our story. And I'm going to fast forward a little bit because in chapter 13, you come to a story where for the first time, uh, th this early church sets apart uh, their first apostles. Uh, that name, apostle, is very familiar to some of us, but it's a, it's a big word. Basically, it's the same word as missionaries. Apostles are the ones that are sent out. Uh, so when you think of that word apostle, those are the ones that are sent out in the name of Jesus to expand the kingdom of God. And, you know, it's really interesting that they actually, instead of looking at the criteria and having these long discussions, do you know how they chose their apostles or their very first missionaries in chapter 13? It says that they did it in prayer and fasting. And guess whom God chose as their first missionaries? Paul and Barnabas, the best of the best. Their leader. And so probably reluctantly Antioch church will send these people out. And then uh, this is the beginning of this great missionary movement. It starts with Paul and Barnabas. And then they began to travel out of Jerusalem, just as Jesus uh, commanded. And that movement had not stopped until today. The reason why you and I are sitting here today listening to the teachings of our Lord is because somebody decided to take the gospel to the ends of the earth and all the way to China, Korea, India, to the ends of the earth, came to the United States of America. So that's the story that is unfolding. And then there are some other real exciting and also terrible stories that happen. Uh, Paul uh, goes and preaches. He begins to travel to this uh, uh, Asia Minor, which is a European countries in those days, Turkey. Um, he begins to get persecuted. And then and one in chapter 14, he almost gets killed. Uh, the religious leaders decided to stone him to death. And then uh, they dragged him out of the city and everybody thought that he was was dead, but he escapes death, but he does not stop there. Imagine if you almost got stoned for your faith, for preaching the gospel, but he does not stop. He keeps going in chapter 15. Now, as the Gentiles are beginning to hear the gospel and they come into uh, the church, uh, this great debate breaks out. And the whole debate was about whether these believers, Gentile believer, believers should be circumcised or not. If you don't know what circumcision is, please ask the person sitting next to you. I'm not going to go through any illustration, but it's one of those Jewish rituals where if you wanted to become a Jew, you had to be circumcised. And now this debate breaks out and then Paul and Barnabas really had to go and really talk to the whole church, uh, the apostles in those days. So that's chapter 15. And then uh, something really interesting happens. Paul and Barnabas, these two best missionaries that were sent out in chapter 13, you know what happened to them? They get into a huge argument. 
And literally, uh, their missionary uh, team breaks up. Uh, it was over this little tiny event where, you know, Barnabas wanted to take John, Mark, uh, and Paul did not like him because he backed out when they were on their way to their first missionary journey. And he says, he's not worthy. So they actually get into this argument and then they part their ways. It's almost like Douglas and I getting into a huge argument or a fight. And then we decided to break up New Vine and half of them go to Mountain View and the other half go to Los Altos. Now, it's really interesting that Bible would actually record these kind of details. This is one of the reasons why it's, it's a real historical book. Bible is not shy about some of the early struggles and the troubles and, and all the ugly things that happen. That's just part of our walk, our journey. So all those things I kind of summarized so that it's not going to linger in the back of your mind. What's 13, 14, 15 about. And then today we're actually going to look at chapter 16. And again, this is going back to that whole theme of how God is really in control. So as we look at this, I'm going to have us read from verse six through 24. It's a little bit long, but let's go ahead and read together from verse six. Okay. One, two, three. She was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. When she and the members of her household were baptized, she invited us to her home. If you consider me a believer in the Lord, she said, come and stay at my house. And she persuaded us. Once, when we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a female slave who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. She earned a great deal of money for her owners by fortune telling. She followed Paul and the rest of us shouting, these men are servants of the most high God who are telling you the way to be saved. She kept this up for many days. Finally, Paul became so annoyed that he turned around and said to the spirit in the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. At that moment, the spirit left her. When her owners realized that their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and begged them into the marketplace to face the authorities. They brought them before the magistrates and said, these men are Jews and are throwing our city into an uproar by advocating customs unlawful for us Romans to accept or practice. The crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas. And the magistrates order them to be stripped and beaten with rods. They, they were thrown into prison and their jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. When he received these orders, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. Um, I, I want to encourage you to read a, f uh, a few more verses in chapter 16 when you go home, but I'm going to try to explain. Um, this is a historical lesson, but it's more than just a history. Uh, why does the Bible give us all these details? Uh, it's not just to inform us of what happened, but I believe that there, there are some significant lessons, especially doctrinal lessons that will literally change the way we view our Christian faith and we view the world. We view God. 
So I'm going to try to explain these, uh, just a few of these things, but uh, I think it's, we read a lot, so it's really hard to figure out what's really going on, but uh, think about this. I'll just briefly explain. Uh, this is the first time that Paul now is, he has a brand new missionary team, and now Luke and Silas joined, and that's why Luke is able to record this entire book. He's the one who wrote the book of Acts. So in his eyes, this is like the first hand experience and he records all these details. And remember, he's not one of those who were discipled by Jesus. He probably was a brand new Christian. Uh, so everything is fresh. And here in this story that we just read, three things happen. Uh, Paul and his team ends up uh, going to a place called Macedonia. Uh, and, you know, it's quite interesting that Paul actually wanted to preach the gospel in what, what is known as Asia Minor. Uh, I think I have a map. Uh, if you look at the map of the ancient uh, Bible times, below Syria, if you go all the way down, that's really where Israel, Jerusalem is. And so they just keep uh, preaching the gospel. And now they reached uh, a place called Galatia and Asia. This would be the modern day Turkey. And uh, Paul had a plan. He actually wanted to preach the gospel in Asia Minor. And do you remember what he said in the passage that we just read? He says, God did not allow them to speak. The Holy Spirit allowed them not, uh, did not allow them to actually preach the gospel. Now that's strange, right? We're supposed to preach the gospel in season and out of season at all times. And yet here's a moment where the Holy Spirit directs them not to speak. So Paul being smart, he decides to just keep going. Maybe this is not the place. So he actually decides to go all the way to a place called Bithynia, which is the Northern part. And then again, here in this chapter, we just read that the Holy Spirit did not allow them to enter into the region of Bithynia. Now that's really puzzling. We're talking about a missionary journey. So what does Paul do? Paul and his team, they just decide to keep going. Uh, if I got turned down by God from preaching in places like Asia and then he couldn't go further up north, I would just go home, right? go back, but he goes all the way to the port city uh, where you see the, the actually the land is divided by Asian sea and Troas is one of the tiny little poor city on the Northern part. And he goes to this place called Troas and now he's at a dead end. Uh, he either has to take a ship and cross over, which is probably unreasonable. So he doesn't know what to do. And then that night he gets a vision from the Lord actually not from the Lord, but vision from a man from Macedonia. Macedonia is all the way across the sea. And here's a man who's calling, come over and help us. And nobody has ever taken the gospel over to Macedonia yet. You know, those will be like, the southern part will be Greece and I think Albania. What other countries are part of that Macedonia? Douglas probably knows this better, right? He travels so much. Huh? So all those Eastern Europe, uh, Kosovo, all those places, Eastern Europe will be on that part of uh, Macedonia. And so this is what happens. Paul and his team actually crosses all the way over. And then now Paul did not have a plan for this. And there are three things that happen in this story. Number one, he meets this woman uh, whose name was Lydia. She was a very successful businesswoman. She was a dealer of a purple garment and uh, she comes out, uh, on Sunday or Sabbath day and Paul is kind of looking around and then she gets to hear the gospel and she gets converted and she gets baptized. And not only that, her entire household gets baptized and then she invites the team to come and stay at her place. So that's the first thing that happened. The second thing that happened is that as Paul was traveling in Macedonia and preaching the gospel, there was this one slave girl who had an unusual gift of fortune telling. In fact, she was so, so, so good at her craft that she was able to make a lot of money for her master. And this slave girl is literally following Paul around everywhere he goes, everywhere the gospel is being preached. This girl cries out. These are the servants of the most high God who are here to tell us the way of salvation. Now, if just anybody is crying that out, you know, it's one thing, but we're talking about this girl who probably has a lot of huge following. 
a fortune teller who was making money by telling fortune. And she is declaring that Paul and his team are the servants of the most high God. And, and it says that Paul was not out of compassion, not because she needed healing, but because Paul was annoyed. You ever been annoyed by somebody who's actually trying to promote you or help you say good things about you? He was so annoyed that he turns around and casts out the demon out of her. So they can no longer make money off her. So what happened? Because of that event, they get thrown into the prison. Uh, and, uh, and then there's this remarkable story. We did not go all the way through the book, uh, chapter 16, but if you read on, remember, this is a story that a lot of our children learn in their Sunday school, Paul and Silas, they were locked up in prison. And then all of a sudden in the middle of the night, earthquake comes and then literally their chains shatter, just like in chapter 12 when Peter was rescued. So um, this prison guard was supposed to keep watch over this, these guys, Paul and Silas. And yet in the middle of the night, they get freed up. And then the prison guard wakes up from his sleep and he realizes that they're free. They're gone. So do you remember what he tried to do? Try to kill himself because he's a dead man already. And then Paul stops him and he actually preaches the gospel. He goes to his house and his entire household gets saved. So those are the three things, three miracles that happen. Now, what this story is telling us or teaching us is that even though Paul had a plan, who was in control? Who had an agenda? Who had a higher agenda? Paul could not do what he actually had planned to do. God actually intervened and he overtakes the plan and he sends them all the way to a place called Macedonia. And then Paul experiences these three events. Now, it doesn't make any sense to us. In those days, uh, people were literally coming to Christ by hundreds, if not by thousands. Now, he goes all the way to a place called Macedonia, probably paid a lot of money to cross over that Asian sea. And all of his fruit, three people, Lydia, fortune teller, and the jailer. That was the fruit of their labor. Uh, we could have looked at it and said, that what a waste. What a lot of suffering for foreign missionaries. Does it make any sense? I want you to listen carefully. When you think of evangelism and missions today, I think about how we strategize our missions, endeavor, our effort. Uh, we're having this missions conference uh, in two weeks. Uh, is it really about strategizing for how we're going to reach the world? Uh, even when you think of our ministry, now New Vine is two years old, but we think about the ministry. There are actually just some very simple, basic motivations for us to go and preach the gospel or help other people. Three things that drive our missions and our evangelism effort comes down to these three things. Number one, compassion. Uh, we ought to have compassion, right? There are people who are dying without Christ in other parts of the world. You know, every time we turn on the TV late at night, you know, there, there are these screens of just flash screens of, you know, kids that are starving from starvation, uh, drug addicts, homeless people, all these things speak to the core of our, our soul, our compassion. And oftentimes we're moved to serve people. We're moved to go and, and share the resources that we have because of our compassion. So that's the primary reason. Another reason that I can give is need. We have so much need around us, right? I don't know how many times I hear the missiologists and sociologists talk about how other parts of the world where the gospel has not been preached. Uh, we give them titles and names, 1040 windows and unreached people groups. And all, we come up with all these terms and the primary motivation to send out our missionaries because there's a need to preach the gospel. And that's a good reason. 
We should all have the burden to preach the gospel. Another reason that I can give uh, is our own reason, human reason, human strategy. You think Paul had a strategy here? He had a very clear strategy in his head, right? What was his plan? From Galatia, he wanted to go into? He actually didn't think about going into Macedonia. He wanted to go into Asia, Asia Minor. Do you know, if you go back to that map, you know that Asia is not China, Korea, uh, Vietnam. Uh, in those days, Asia is actually uh, the eastern part of uh, Turkey, Europe. Uh, that Asia is where actually churches like Ephesus comes from. If he did not preach the gospel there, we would not actually have the book of Revelation today. The seven churches that are listed there all come from that area, Asia. And eventually, Paul actually goes back in a la later journey and he preached the gospel and he planted the churches, the seven churches that we read about in the book of Revelation, they were all planted in the land of Asia and other surrounding areas. So God did it in his own timing, but Paul had this strategy, but God had a different strategy. His plan was to send them to Macedonia for these three families that we had no idea who they were. And their, their names are actually not mentioned again. And it says that the spirit actually prevented them from either speaking or entering into other strategic parts. So what is teaching us is that compassion need and, and our human reason and strategy. Those are all good things, but those are not the ultimate reasons. Sometimes God's agenda and his plan will override and overrule our good plan and our good nature and our heart. Do you know what actually is happening here in this story? Do you know why God chose to actually send Paul and his team all the way to Macedonia instead of having them preach the gospel in Asia, which was actually very, very strategic. God had a different plan. Lydia, again, was a, a very wealthy and successful businesswoman. Out of all the people uh, on uh, Sabbath day, Paul was out in the courtyard. Uh, it's actually, that's what synagogue is. In, in, the, in the old days, if there are 10 men that gather together, that literally forms a church or a synagogue. So he was just out looking for someone to preach the gospel to. And uh, I don't know if Lydia was the only person there, but the only person that comes into Paul's attention is this woman, Lydia. And then in verse 14, I think it's verse 14 or yeah. One of those listening was woman from the city of Thyatri, the Tyra, uh, go to the next one, a uh, name Lydia, a dealer in purple clothes. Now listen to what he says here. When she and the, uh, where is it? Uh, right here. She was a worshiper of God. So she already wanted to worship Yahweh, but it says the Lord opened our heart to respond to Paul's message. So in other, in other words, if the Lord had not opened her heart, she would not have understood what Paul was saying. You know, what's really striking to me is that we think that it's our clever preaching or the anointing or whatever it is, uh, our skills in communication, those things will convince people, but those things cannot change the heart of men, so, uh, heart of men and women. It's only the spirit of God that can actually open our spirit to listen and understand. That's exactly what happens here. So Lydia becomes a believer and, and she introduces her entire family to the gospel and then they get baptized and they become believers. And then I already told you about this fortune telling slave girl. You know, if I were Paul, I would have probably found a way to validate our ministry or make our gospel more credible by utilizing her, right? Here's a woman who is clearly demon possessed, but she's basically telling that, you know, Paul and Silas, that whole team is, are the, they are the servants of the most high God. And yet Paul is not moved by compassion. It was not the need for her to be healed. It wasn't even strategic. Paul was simply 
annoyed. And he turns around and delivers this girl. And she can no longer fortune tell because the spirit had left. And that event leads them to be imprisoned. And then you hear this story, the prison guard or jailer gets saved and his entire house gets saved. Three families. What was the purpose? You know what the purpose was? Later on, if you read 2 Corinthians and places like Philippians, you're going to discover that these three families are the founding members of the church called the Church of Philippi. Otherwise, you would not have the book of Philippians. In chapter 4 of Philippians, you know what call, Paul calls them? Calls the people of the Church of Philippi? You're my crown and jewel. Crown of my joy. This is the church. When preaching the gospel and, and, and spreading uh, throughout you know, different parts of Asia became so difficult and, and church, because of the persecution, began to drop their support. Even Antioch church that sent them out, they could not support Paul and their ministry. So do you remember what Paul ended up doing in order to preach the gospel? He became a tent maker. That's where the word tent maker comes from. So he starts selling tents. The church of Philippi was the only church that continued to support Paul's ministry so that the gospel can actually reach Rome and beyond. Think about that. Paul thought that he had a very clever strategy of how to reach the whole Asia Minor. In the meantime, God's purpose for Paul and his team was not to be successful in their preaching ministry, but to really plan for the future, what was about to come. Goes all the way to Macedonia, meets three families, and they become the household of faith. And they plant the church. They start this congregation called the Church of Philippi. They remain small all throughout. It doesn't tell us how big they became. It was a smaller church, but full of love, full of joy, dedicated to Paul's ministry. That was God's plan. What's the lesson that God is teaching us today? What do we take away from a story like this? We have so many different reasons to get involved in ministry, to give our lives and to serve. Uh, we could say it's compassion that we have for people. Uh, human need, human reason, or it may be a very strategic things to do. Those are all important motivations, but it's not enough. We really need to discern the will of God at times and God's plan might be different from what drives us, what drives you and me to serve other people. Sometimes he'll, he'll tell us to do things that just don't make any sense. Sometimes we'll come back totally empty-handed. Probably Paul and his team felt like you know, their, their trip to Macedonia was a massive failure. Even after all those miracles, only three families committed to follow Christ. But what may seem like a failure to us, maybe God's sovereign plan, preparing for the future, what is to come. So that's a very important lesson. But the second lesson that I want to remind you is, again, this is what I said in the beginning. You, you have to realize that God is in control. He's never lost control. You know, the idea, a very dangerous idea that is being preached today in the church is that God needs our help. God does not need you nor me. If we get to serve him, it's a privilege that he gives to us. I don't know how many times when we go to missions conference, and I hope this is not preached on during our mission conference, the motivation for a great mission conference, why we should give 
towards missions, why we should send out people and why we should go on short term missions trip. You know, we have bought into this idea that if we do not go from Isaiah 6, whom shall I send? If I do not go, God's not going to be able to accomplish his mission. He's going to fail. So, you know, we try to save God, his face. If you travel around the world and really try to understand what the Lord is doing, uh, sometimes we feel like God is really losing control over this world. Uh, I was having this conversation with one of the missionaries that we sent out. Uh, she's serving in China and, and she was telling me about the persecutions that the, the local churches are going through right now. You may think that God has lost control. You know what I heard when, in last April when I traveled and talked to some of the leaders? When the persecution began to break out, one of the leaders, this is what he told me. This is a good thing for the Chinese church. This will purify the church in China. Because already the Chinese churches are becoming like the Western churches. We're becoming too worldly. And this persecution will keep us pure. Don't ever think that God has lost control over this world and that we have to pray so that God can change his mind and do something about the world. That's a bad, terrible theology. He has never lost control. Jesus said he would come back with the fullness of his kingdom. The reason why he hasn't come back in 2000 years is because today still he has a heart of mercy over this world and is extending his time. It's not because we failed in our missions effort or God failed. The whole world will come to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. And this world will come to an end one day. And it is moving according to God's perfect plan and timing. You and I, our role is to say yes whenever he calls us. It's a privilege. If you don't say yes, you're not going to fail God. Do you know what's going to happen? It's going to move on. You're going to miss out. This generation has a fear of missing out, right? FOMO, right? You're going to miss out on some great adventures that God has for us. So that's the second lesson. We have to remind ourselves that God is in absolute control over this entire uh, universe. That's the, the foundation of our theology about who God is. He reigns. The Lord reigns. The last lesson I want to share with you is that if this is true, the most important skill that we can develop as believers is to hear and to discern the voice of the Holy Spirit. This should be the longing of our hearts. Not that we all have ability or some kind of creative minds to come up with some great plans to expand the kingdom of God. But if this is true and God is in control, he's moving around looking for people to say yes to his call. All we need is just willingness to say yes and ability to hear his voice when he calls out our name. Believe it or not, that's the battle that I fight every day. It's not about having clear strategy or coming up with some creative ideas. My role as a leader for both New Vine and San Jose and, and whoever that I'm leading is really to understand and discern the will of God and say yes when he tells me to go in certain directions. Paul probably had every reason not to go to Macedonia. It just didn't. It wasn't, a good, it wasn't a good plan. And yet, somehow he had the ability to hear and discern. This must be from the Lord. So develop, have longing to develop those skills. And, and again, you know, it's not easy to hear and discern the voice of God. Uh, it's just like learning how to speak and learning how to hear. I have a little puppy that I'm training right now. Uh, he knows my voice. He's learning how to discern my will. He understands no very clearly. He understands sit. He understands quiet. She, I'm sorry. <laughs> she. 
It's just like, you know, a, a little puppy understanding the will of her master. It is in the same way that unless we keep pressing in, unless we spend time with the Lord, and unless we learn to discern the will of God, we will miss out on the plans that he has. So this is probably one of the most important gifts that we can develop and we need to develop as a church. So tonight, as we wrap up, uh, I think this is very fitting. We're celebrating our second year anniversary. And I think, I feel like the Lord is upgrading our faith and he's promoting us to the next season. Uh, again, just like I said on the very first day, I have this dream of God sending us out with his anointing, his favor. Even though we're still relatively small, that we will have a significant part of what God is doing in our history all around the world. So I think it's fitting for us to uh, end our time just really praying and praying for one another, praying for ourselves uh, really surrendering our own plans and our own will. If you ask me today, if I have a great vision for the next three, five years of our future of our new vine church, honestly, I don't, I don't really, I don't know. I, I don't know where the Lord is going to take us, but it's going to be exciting. And I just know the deepest part of my spirit that he will not disappoint us. He has a perfect plan and, and we're part of that plan right now. That's good enough for me. So will you stand with me as, as we wrap, wrap up our time? Uh, I'm going to ask you to just get into groups of four or five people around you. And uh, if you don't feel comfortable praying out loud in English, that's fine. You can just listen. But if you can, you can choose any language that you're comfortable with. And we're just going to really bless uh, uh, this church that got started. Uh, Pray that we'll be like the church of Philippi in some ways, uh, that we're one of those churches that God is literally hiding away and preparing for the future to support potentially missionaries, but also to make a, a, a tremendous impact for the kingdom of God. So we're going to pray and then we're going to really pray for one another tonight that we will really develop our ability to hear and to discern the voice of the Holy Spirit. Uh, we'll never miss the heartbeat of God when he speaks. So we'll pray over one another, pray together, and then uh, I'll, we'll, I'll close us in about a few minutes, okay? Father, we exist today as a New Vine Community Church because there were a few who were willing to say yes to your call and to simply obey, not knowing uh, what your plan was. We're grateful for where you have uh, brought us as a family. Uh, Father, the humble beginning of the Church of Philippi resembles much of what goes on here in the Church of New Vine. But Lord, as we enter into this third year season, uh, Father, we pray that we will become more attentive. We will, we will become a church that listens to your voice. And we will have the ability uh, to discern your will for our future. And even though we're still small, Father, we do pray that we will be part of a, a, an amazing story that you're writing all around us. We rejoice in the fact that you still reign today. Uh, you're not out of control. Uh, the whole human history is moving according to your perfect plan. Father, we pray that this small church will not be left out of your plan, but will be a significant part of the great story that you're writing. So encourage us today as we celebrate and give us greater faith to believe that your work is just begun with us, Lord. Will you empower us with faith, with courage, with the ability to hear your voice and just a simple faith to obey for everything that you show us in the coming days, Lord. We thank you for uh, giving one another to us. This is the most precious gift that we receive today. Teach us how to love one another in a way that the world will come to know that we belong to you. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen.